so thanks for coming. Uh, I'm Alice. Uh, this is my very first webinar, and so I'm very excited to share this content with you. Um, and today's topic is going to be healthy budget eat, so healthy eating on a budget. Just a little bit more about me. Uh, my name's Alice, like Caitlin said. I'm a registered dietitian, um, so that means I've gone through the necessary schooling, I've gone through an accredited program, um, with the necessary classes and internships, and taken a test to become registered as a dietitian, um, as opposed to a nutritionist, which is really regulated, and doesn't have that same uh, requirement as a dietitian does. Uh, I'm originally, uh, I was raised in West Jordan, Utah, it's south of Salt Lake City, if you've ever been, if you've ever been there. Um, I went to school at the University of Utah, got my bachelor's in exercise science, and then my master's in nutrition and dietetics. Uh, so I'm a proud Utah grad. And then my current position is at WSU here in Pullman with uh, specifically with dining services. So most of my work on a day-to-day -day basis involves um, menu planning with the chefs, um, do a lot of work with recipes, labeling allergens, meeting with students who have allergies or special dietary needs, um, and generally making sure that there are healthy options on campus when it comes to dining uh, in the dining centers. So just a quick overview of some things we'll discuss today. Uh, so I've broken it down to a few parts. So first we're gonna focus on ingredients on a budget. So what are some ingredients you can look for when you're shopping uh, to be, that are budget friendly items you can use in recipes and simple strategies for each food group to save money uh, while, not, while uh, still being able to get all the nutrients we need for a healthy diet. And we'll focus on three main food groups, so whole grains, protein and fruits and vegetables, and then some miscellaneous things as well at the end. And then the next part will be more about integrating those ingredients we found at the store into recipes, where to find recipes, uh, and then putting it all together into meal prepping and meal prepping in a way that's efficient so we're not spending a lot of time play, uh, making uh, recipes or cooking. Uh, and we have meals prepared for those times when, you know, it's five o'clock and we don't have something planned for dinner, but we have something to pull out of the fridge really quickly. So we don't end up going uh, to, you know, Wendy's, like someone said in the chat box earlier, or going out to eat and spending money that we'd rather save for other things. And then at the end, uh, we'll have some time for questions. So feel free to post those, and Caitlin will uh, organize and sort those as we go through the discussion here. And we'll answer them at the end. Right, so here we go. So uh, first little part, key ingredients for healthy, budget-friendly meals. So focusing on whole grains, proteins, fruits, and vegetables. And out of those food groups, um, we're gonna get most of the nutrition we need. And those are the most, and uh, in each food group, there are strategies to save money when at the store, and I'll show you some of those. So starting with uh, whole grains. So a lot of you have probably heard the term whole grains. Um, you've probably seen it on label, you've seen it at the store, maybe in commercials. Um, when cereals are made with whole grains, they often advertise that because uh, it makes it seem more uh, healthy. And what whole grains are is, simply put, uh, if you see this, look at this picture here, it's from uh, it's Whole Grains Council website, which Caitlin will post a link to in the chat box for more information. The whole grains are essentially what the name suggests, the grain in its whole intact form. So if you look over here in this photo, um, this is a grain in its whole intact form. So it, it has three layers. So it's got the bran here, the endosperm in the middle, and then the germ as the inner part. And when grains are refined, so let's say you have brown rice and you refine it to white rice, some of this is removed. So one or more parts of, this, of these layers are removed. So in the case of white rice, I believe they take off the bran and I think they take out the germ as well. And so when we remove these parts, we're removing the nutrition as well. And most of that nutrition loss is fiber, but you also lose some protein, uh, some B vitamins, uh, some minerals as well. So generally speaking, when you are uh, consuming refined grains as opposed to whole grains, you're not getting as much fiber as you would if you were eating the whole grain in, in its intact form. Uh, and you are also losing out on a little bit of protein and vitamins and minerals as well. So that's why whole grains are a better choice for us. Um, and we encourage eating whole grains most of the time. So some examples of whole grains uh, that you've probably heard of are things like oats, uh, brown rice, quinoa, millet, uh, whole wheat flour, and really anything made with whole wheat flour. So you'll see in stores whole wheat pasta, you'll see whole wheat cereals, 
uh, whole wheat snack bars, uh, tortillas, anything made of whole wheat flour would be a whole grain. And then there are also whole grain breads and pastas, um, not necessarily made of, sometimes made of flour, but also made with, you know, those brown rice pasta and quinoa pasta nowadays that are considered whole grain because they are made with brown rice and quinoa, even though they're not made with wheat, they're still whole grains. Um, and for a complete list of all whole grains, and uh, this is a great website, the Whole Grains Council, it'll list all the whole grains there are. Um, it'll tell you which ones are gluten-free if you follow a gluten-free diet or have an intolerance or celiac disease. It'll tell you exactly which ones are safe for you to eat. So that's a great reference for more information on whole grains. So how do we save money on buying whole grains? So you'll hear this a lot. Um, when it comes to shopping on a budget. But buying in bulk when it comes to grains is going to be the most effective way to save money. And that's mostly because, first of all, uh, when you buy in bulk, they almost always uh, cost less per pound. So um, you can compare the bulk price per pound to something, the same grain in a package form, and it will almost always be uh, more cost efficient to buy it in bulk. And secondly, uh, when you buy in bulk, you can also buy as much or as little as you want. So if you're trying out a new grain, let's say you've never had millet before and you want to try it out, uh, you're not sure if you like it, so you just want to buy a little bit, you can buy that in the bulk section as opposed to buying a huge bag. And if, if you end up not liking it or not being able to use it, the bag would go to waste. So buying bulk reduces food waste and can save you money as well. And uh, if you don't have a bulk section uh, in a store where, next to where you live, uh, the other possibility is to find, simply find the same grain in a larger size. So oftentimes you'll see uh, things like brown rice and oats in smaller bags or containers. And many stores nowadays have different options for sizes when it comes to grain. So you can get 16 ounce bags or you can get 32 ounce bags. Um, depending on the grain, you can almost always find a larger size if you look around a bit more in the same aisle. And generally speaking, the larger size is going to be the better bang for your buck, again, because it's a larger size. So in a way, you're buying in bulk, even though it's not necessarily from a bulk section per se. And then with grains, the least expensive ones are usually going to be the oats, the brown rice, uh, millet, and your pasta. So sticking to those grains and um, using those when it comes to recipes is going to save a lot of money. And the great thing about grains is that most of them are pretty interchangeable when it comes to using one or the other. And they all cook pretty similarly. So most grains have a two to one ratio of water to the grain, either uh, two, two cups to, of water to one cup of grain, or sometimes some grains will have three cups of water to one cup of grain. And all it is, it's a boil, bring to boil, reduce to a simmer, and cook it for however long it takes to soften. And uh, if you do shop at the bulk section, in most cases, the bulk section will have some sort of sticker at the very front of the label of the canister that tells you how to cook those items. Uh, if you're buying from a bag, usually there's instructions on how to cook the item on the bag as well. Or you can also look at that Whole Grains Council website for a complete uh, list of how to cook each grain if you're trying something new that you've never tried before. And then uh, if you have a recipe that calls for a more expensive grain, a good way to save money is to swap it for a similar grain. So for example, uh, there are lots of salad recipes out there that are wild rice salads. And wild rice uh, tends to be pretty expensive. I know around this area, it's about nine to 12 bucks per pound, uh, which is quite a bit. So instead of using all wild rice in the salad or even any wild rice, you could sub in brown rice, which cooks pretty similarly. It doesn't have quite the same texture, but uh, you can do you know half wild rice, half brown rice, and still have a very similar nutrient profile in the final dish than if you just use all brown wild rice. And it would cost you a lot less to use the brown rice. And some stores, uh, bulk sections, you'll even see sometimes sell wild rice blends, which are just a blend of wild rice and brown rice together. And so instead of buying it separately, you can buy it in one, uh, from one container. And then another uh, example would be for a quinoa, like let's say in this stuffed pepper here, instead of using quinoa, you could sub in millet, which has a very similar texture. And again, pretty similar nutrient profile and costs uh, anywhere from half uh, to a quarter as much as quinoa. So that's a great way to save money as well.
Right, so now we're moving on to proteins. So with proteins, uh, protein is important when it comes to building and maintaining the muscle mass that we have. Uh, protein foods are also usually a source of iron, which helps carry the oxygen from our lungs to our tissues to be used. Uh, and then with proteins, we really want to focus on two things. So focusing on leaner proteins, and by that I mean proteins that are less fatty, so leaner cuts of meats, or your plant-based proteins are a good source of protein and don't, typically don't contain a lot of fat. And then we also want to focus on proteins that are less processed. And by process, I mean um, things added to it or processed as in they're taking the whole protein and they've already cut it up or, uh, or uh, um, altered it in some way to make it easier or deboned it. So some sort of labor was involved. And generally speaking, the lean proteins are going to be lower in saturated fat. And saturated fat is typically referred to sometimes as the bad fat, which raises our cholesterol. So we want to limit that. And then with the processed proteins, uh, some of them, things like deli meats or bacon, are higher in sodium. Uh, so we want to limit that as well because sodium is associated with high blood pressure. And so focusing on lean and less processed meats most of the time and uh, limiting and using our, our meats high in saturated fat and proteins high in fat and sodium to, in moderation is generally the, the key points to eating healthy uh, while eating proteins. So when it comes to saving money, uh, conveniently, the less processed and uh, less fatty meats are also the least expensive, which makes it a lot easier to eat healthy. If you look at the data here, this is from the US Bureau of Labor Statistics uh, pulled in August. So on average, red meat in the US, so ground beef, costs about $3.79 per pound. If you compare that to a boneless chicken breast, uh, which on average in the US, it costs about $3.19 per pound, which is a 16% savings. So just by eating less red meat, uh, you're not only getting a healthier meat, you're also saving some money there with the difference between the beef and the chicken breast. And then similarly with the processed meat, it's sort of the same thing, right? Because it's less processed uh, and there's no uh, processing or labor involved, it's going to be less expensive and also a little bit healthier because there's no added sodium there. So with bacon, the average cost of bacon in the U.S. is about $6.24 per pound. And if we compare that to a pork chop, which, you know, this is still comes from a pig, same animal, a pork chop on average costs only $3.92 per pound. So that's going to give you a 37% savings. So save you quite a bit of money there from eating less red meat and less processed meat, uh, which in both cases, it, it also ends up being a healthier choice. Uh, so that's meat. Um, but really, the best bang for your buck is going to be the vegetarian proteins. And I saw someone in the chat box mention they're a vegetarian. And vegetarian diets um, can be really inexpensive compared to uh, meat diets that are heavy in meat. Uh, so if you look at our vegetarian protein sources, eggs, for example, from the same data source, are $1.37 per dozen on average. Beans, if you buy them dried, so again, something you could buy in the bulk section or in larger quantities if you don't have a bulk section, are about $1.35 per pound on average. And that's the equivalent, uh, it varies by the type of bean, but uh, that will yield you about five to six cups of cooked beans. Uh, some types of beans will yield you seven to eight or nine cups of cooked beans. So quite a lot of beans just for one pound. And then your peanut butter on average will be about 251 per pound. Uh, and that's an average of all peanut butter. Sometimes you can, if you have a good bulk sex store, you can buy in bulk and it may be a little bit less expensive. Uh, otherwise, jarred is just fine. Um, but it's typically a little bit more expensive than if you were to buy in bulk or if you were to buy nuts and uh, make your own peanut butter. And then lastly, we did already talk about whole grains, but whole grains are also a source of protein, so you can kind of include that uh, in your thought process when shopping is that whole grains can be a small source of protein, although it's not it's extremely as high as beans or peanut butter or some of these other things. All right, so when it comes to stretching our protein budget, so these are very similar tips to what we talk about when we discuss whole grains. So 
we're using less expensive proteins to replace some or all of the expensive, more expensive proteins, similar uh, to what we talked about when we talked about the whole grain piece. So for example, when you make a meatloaf, instead of using all ground beef, which uh, tends to be more expensive and a little bit higher in fat, you could sub in, you know, you can do a meatloaf with half ground beef and then sub the other half for ground turkey, which is a little bit less expensive or uh, go uh, one step further and do half the ground beef and then the other half, uh, sub the other half with cooked beans or lentils usually work as well. And that's gonna save you even more money than uh, the, the first option. And then lastly, if you wanted to go all out, uh, there are completely plant-based uh, meatloaf recipes out there. Uh, one of my favorites is a meatloaf that is made with uh, chickpeas or garbanzo beans and then mixed with brown rice and carrots, uh, a little bit of ground mustard and that's that's basically and, uh, that's basically it, and it's very simple and has a similar texture to meatloaf, and it's very inexpensive to make, and it tastes great. Uh, and this is one uh, way that people save money, uh, and you don't have to go all out vegetarian to save money. Uh, some people are what we call flexitarians. That's a very popular term nowadays. Uh, flexitarian, or some people call it uh, reducitarian, and what that means is it's just a fancy way of saying. Uh, you're vegetarian, but you're not really married to the idea, or uh, you can be flexible with it. So, for example, maybe you're vegetarian uh, just on certain days of the week, or you're vegetarian when you cook at home, but you're, uh, you're you eat meat sometimes uh, when you go out or when it's a special occasion. So, really, it's a fancy term for saying you're eating less meat, either to save money in this case or for other reasons. Then some other, uh, and lots of folks also participate in what we call Meatless Mondays, which you may have heard of. It's a pretty popular campaign, uh, and it's just what it sounds like. On Mondays, you don't eat meat, and that's a way to uh, save money on your grocery budget. Just have one designated day where all your meals are meatless, and you can have some a little bit of structure in terms of what you're planning, your meal planning is, and that's the one day you save a lot of money because you're not eating any meat, and you're relying on some of these plant-based proteins. All right, and then the last group I wanted to bring up is the fruits and vegetables. So fruits and vegetables uh, are a pretty important group. Uh, generally speaking, we tend to struggle with getting enough vegetables. Uh, fruits, not so much of a problem, but vegetables have a hard time getting on our plates. And ideally, when you sit down for a meal, uh, about half of our plates uh, ideally would be fruits and vegetables. So whatever, this, in this example, it's corn and some fajita vegetables, peppers, things like that. Uh, and we wanna also aim for a variety of colors because each color with a fruit and vegetable is associated with some sort of vitamin or mineral or function to our bodies. For example, we look at uh, things like carrots and sweet potatoes uh, are both orange red and those are, that's because those contain a beta carotene which uh, is similar uh, term for vitamin A, and that aids in keeping our eyes healthy and helping our eyes see, especially in the dark. Uh, but if you look at your green leafy vegetables like spinach and kale, those are high in vitamin K, which helps with blood clotting. They also contain calcium for bone health, um, iron for blood health. So every color has a different purpose. Uh, and so it's important to get as much variety as possible of colors, just to get that whole spectrum of vitamins and minerals that our bodies need. So how do we save money on fruits and vegetables? And there are a lot of different ways to do this one. This one's probably the most complicated group because um, there are a lot of different strategies to use. But the first one uh, I would say, and this is probably one you've heard the most, is to buy fruits and vegetables in season. So things like uh, apples and potatoes, uh, tomatoes, uh, bananas tend to be inexpensive year round. But other things like uh, sweet potatoes, spinach, kale, uh, eggplant, uh, cauliflower, broccoli, those tend to be pretty seasonal and the prices fluctuate. If they're out of season, they tend to be a lot higher in price. So being creative with what's in season and uh, trying new vegetables based on price. So if there's a vegetable you see that's in season and it's on sale and you've never tried it before, uh, I challenge you to be adventurous and go ahead and purchase that and uh, research ways on how to use it. And I'll show you some websites later uh, that will help you find some recipes but look at ways uh, how you can cook it, roast it, 
and try a new vegetable uh, because it's in season. It'll help you save some money and also help you venture out into some new culinary adventures as well. And then secondly, if it's out of season, especially this comes in handy. So let's say you have a recipe that calls for uh, spinach or kale and it's out of season and it's very inexpensive in the fresh form. It's a good uh, strategy to look for it in frozen or canned form because when it's, especially when it's out of season, the frozen or the canned form can be a lot less expensive than the fresh form. And uh, the nutrient quality is just about the same. Uh, when it comes to frozen, I would say the general taste quality tends to be about the same as fresh. Um, canned, it's sometimes a hit or miss with the quality, depending on, uh, it's use your own judgment with that. Uh, but price-wise, there's sometimes a big difference depending on what's in season and what's on sale. And another bonus is that the frozen and the canned vegetables and fruits have a longer shelf life. So if you're looking to buy a lot and store it, uh, you can buy that when it's on sale and stock up and save it for later. And then similarly to that, uh, buying in bulk. So I talked about stocking up when things are on sale. You can also stock up when fresh produce is on sale or in season and inexpensive. And if you have the means to uh, or ability to can things or freeze things. Um, most fruits and vegetables freeze pretty well uh, if they're processed or chopped up. And if you have a fruit or vegetable that you really like and want to buy a lot of it while it's in season, um, you can look up how to process that to make it safe for canning or how to freeze it properly so that it lasts up to months and you can eat it in off season and have that for later. You can also uh, use farmer's markets. So you can often buy bulk in farmer's markets. So typically with most farmer's markets, they offer either uh, price per pound or price per box. And usually when you buy uh, fruits or vegetables, uh, let's say over 10 pounds of it or over 20 pounds, they often will give you a discount of, generally speaking, uh, with my farmer's market, it's about 20 cents less per pound if you buy greater than 10 or 20 pounds. And if you don't have a means to freeze that or store that or use it up in time before it goes bad, you can also consider sharing that with a friend, so splitting the cost with a friend, and then you're both taking half of it so you don't have as much to use worry about using up, but you still get that discount. And then you can also, if you have this available near where you live, a farm that offers you pick uh, because you take the labor cost out of it, and if you pick your own fruit, uh, the price of fruits and vegetables for picking your own tends to be a lot less expensive than if you were to buy it directly or buy it at a market or buy it at the produce section at the store because you're picking it by yourself and you're also buying directly from the farm. Uh, and that way you're still supporting a local, a local farm as well. So lots of benefit to that. And then, so that's kind of the three food groups, but anything that I didn't talk about uh, probably falls under what I just categorized as miscellaneous items. And uh, most likely the things you're thinking of that I didn't cover are things that are packaged. So things like your milk, uh, canned goods, snacks, chips, uh, things that come in packages. And with packaged products, I always uh, ask myself one question if I'm buying a packaged product is, if it's something I can make myself, so for example, if you often buy uh, beans that are already cooked or in a can, um, it's that something you can make yourself. Uh, in this case, it's something you could buy in bulk. And even though it takes a little bit of extra effort to soak the beans when you buy it from dried and then cook them, uh, with a can of cooked beans, uh, let's say a can of cooked beans, canned beans cost about, uh, let's say, $1.15, you're only getting about a cup at one and three quarters of a cup of beans. Whereas for the same price, a dollar, a dollar fifteen, you could get a pound of dried beans, and uh, soak it, and then cook it yourself, and get about five to six cups of beans. So almost, or so more than three times the amount of beans for the exact same price. So that's an example of something easy you could do yourself. Um, and I'll show you some a link later that will uh, have some instructions on how to cook beans from dried if you don't know how to do that yet. Uh, similarly, with stock or broth, if you if you buy if you make soups pretty often and use veggie stock or chicken broth uh, and buy it from the store. That's also something we can cut the cost of by making our own, uh, really just simmering vegetables or uh, in water. And that's an easy uh, thing to do and that freezes pretty well. And that's something you can cut the, you know, save two or three dollars off of a carton of stock each time you do that. And it also tastes better. 
And oftentimes, uh, stocks or broth that you buy at the store uh, have a lot of added sodium to it. So by making your own, you can also make it a little bit healthier by uh, controlling the salt content a bit more or reducing the sodium. Uh, some other just quick examples, granola bars, again, something that comes in a package that is uh, probably something we can make ourselves, and then salad dressings, uh, hundreds of other examples out there, but those are just a couple. And uh, there are always going to be things that we can't make ourselves or we just don't have the time to and uh, want to go for convenience. And with those situations, I recommend looking for coupons for those items or buying them when they're on sale. Uh, and with things that are brand, especially uh, really famous brands, you can almost always find coupons online. So if you look up the website of the brand, just look up their website, do a quick internet search of the brand name, find the website. More often than not, and surprisingly more often, they'll have coupons just run on their website for your print. Uh, no need to sign up for an email list or anything like that. Uh, you can just print it and save a buck or two here and there when buying the product. Uh, or sometimes, uh, if you do sign up for the email address of a certain brand that you like or follow pretty loyally, they will send you coupons every month or so. Or when they have uh, deals, they'll send you an email and let you know. Or uh, another way is by following them on social media. So almost uh, all, I would say quite a few brands are on social media, whether it's Twitter or Facebook. And oftentimes they'll post when they have coupons available or deals, uh, they'll post that on their Facebook page or have special, some sort of special contest where if you like a page, they'll like their page or share their page. They'll give you a coupon, some sort of offer uh, similar to that, and that's a good way to get coupons. Uh, and if you combine that by waiting, uh, with waiting for when things are on sale, so let's say you read ads for uh, certain markets and see that something's on sale that you like and it's packaged, you can buy a lot of that, and typically with packaged products, let's say canned products, things that come in boxes or granola bars, those last a long time. They have a very long shelf life. So when you wait for them to be on sale, uh, buy a lot of it if you're gonna if you have the means to use all of it and store because it does last a long time, and then you don't have to worry about buying so much of it later on, and you can also save a lot of money because you're getting it on sale. Uh, if you combine that with coupons, you'll get an even bigger discount. And then uh, another tip, uh, looking for store brands. So this isn't always the case, but almost always store brands uh, are the equivalent in terms of quality to the name brand item. Uh, not always, but most of the time. And it's almost always going to be lower in cost. Uh, and it's not always at eye level at the store. The, sometimes the store brands are lower or higher than the name brand item on the shelf. So just being aware of that and looking around and comparing prices before you buy the item is a good tip as well. Uh, and then something I didn't put on the slide but I thought of earlier today is if it's an ingredient for a recipe, uh, think about whether or not you can substitute it with something else or if you can just leave it out in general. So for example, if you have a soup recipe that calls for uh, paprika or smoked paprika and you don't have that, um, you can either leave it out or use something like chili powder or cayenne or sriracha, which are all spicy ingredients and that can mimic the same taste as paprika. Uh, or something else, another example would be if you have a baking recipe that calls for applesauce, you could use mashed banana instead it's, or any sort of pureed fruit in the same volume and uh, get the same similar taste and quality in the final baked product. So any sort of substitutes that you can think of similar to those. Right, so that's sort of the ingredient piece of the presentation. So next up, we're going to move on to more of utilizing what you buy in the store and finding recipes that fit those ingredients uh, and then meal planning and preparation of those recipes to save you time and money. So uh, I think one of the hardest parts of meal planning, especially if you haven't cooked a lot, is finding good recipes. And there are a lot of links out there. There are a lot of good websites I really like. But I would say the two resources I suggest the most are these two websites here, which uh, Caitlin will link in the chat box. Uh, the first one is supercook.com. And supercook.com is a website that was designed for, uh, with it, for people who wanted to use up things in, already in their pantry. So I'll show you this in a minute. And then the second one is this cookbook called Good and Cheap. 
And let me just pull out of here and show you these sites. So here is the website for supercook.com. And so what it is, it's a website th uh, that lets you search for recipes based on what you have on hand. So you can either do this as a guest or um, create an account so you can save your pantry items in your account. But uh, just a quick overview is what you do is um, click on what ingredients you have in your pantry. So let's say I have garlic in my pantry, I have onions, I have tomatoes, I have potatoes, uh, bell peppers. Uh, let's go down to let's go down to baking. Let's say I have flour and I have whole wheat flour and I have pasta. So what this website does is it, it will show us uh, what recipes we can make based on what we have on hand or what we've selected here. And so we can make this uh, salsa de tomate. We can make this tomato sauce because we have all the ingredients. Uh, and then if you scroll down, it'll also show you. Uh, if you load all the way down recipes where you have most of the ingredients and then it will mention to you uh, what ingredients you're missing and that you need to buy uh, sometimes if you if you uh, do too many have too many ingredients it won't show them but if you're missing one or two ingredients it'll list them and say you need to buy you know bacon for this you need to buy carrots for this recipe but you've got this this and this uh, as you can see, just from clicking those four or five items, we have all the recipes or all the ingredients necessary for all of these recipes. So that's a good go-to to find recipes. And you can also uh, narrow it down by meal type or if uh, you're vegetarian or vegan or have some sort of special dietary need, you can also select for that and screen for those recipes. All right. And the second link uh, I provided is this Good and Cheap Cookbook. So this was a cookbook designed by a, a woman named Leanne Brown, based out of New York. And this was her project for her master's. And what she did was she uh, compiled a bunch of recipes based on the budget of eating well on $4 a day, which is the average amount a person gets when they're on SNAP benefits or EBT, uh, formerly known as food stamps. So this book is all based on being on a budget and utilizes a lot of the ingredients we talked about, things like oats, uh, things like in-season vegetables, uh, eggs, uh, peanut butter, all of those budget-friendly ingredients. And it's also a good uh, go-to cookbook because it does talk about a lot of things we've already discussed, uh, buying in bulk, uh, building a pantry, seasonal shopping. Uh, if you look over here, in a couple pages in, it'll talk about um, making your own broth, if you go to the end, it'll talk about uh, how to cook beans from dried. And then it's got quite a few recipes, and it is a, a PDF form available for free online. But you can also buy a hard copy of the book. But the PDF is free, and they will sometimes even update the PDF with new recipes every now and then. Uh, but it's broken down into categories, breakfast, lunch, uh, things on toast. Uh, a good one is different ways to make oatmeal so you're not having the same oatmeal every single day. It has got sweet and savory options, uh, all sorts of fun recipes in this book. So a very good basic cookbook if you're sort of new into cooking and want to venture out a little bit uh, and just want to know the basics. So back to our screen here. So referring back to that cookbook, uh, let's say you're making recipes for the week and you're wanting to choose. Uh, a few recipes that will make it easy on you. So it's a good idea to pick multiple recipes that have ingredients in common. Uh, that, for, uh, for, that, for one, it limits the amount of shopping you need to do. So it limits your shopping list. And then secondly, it also limits the amount of cooking you actually need to do. Because you're cooking uh, you know, one or two ingredients, but using them for you know, four, maybe five recipes. So I've referenced some recipes from the Good and Cheap Cookbook. Uh, in this example. So for example, we have a chickpea chana masala with brown rice uh, that uses chickpeas. We can also use those same chickpeas for these half veggie burgers that are also in the Good and Cheap cookbook. And so we're getting, we can cook one batch of chickpeas but use it for two recipes. And then we can also buy some oats and make, 
you know, the four or five different types of oatmeal uh, described in the book, but also use those same oats to make peanut butter and jelly granola bars. So we're getting breakfast and some snacks there from one ingredient. And they could also use that same peanut butter or you could use uh, sunflower seed butter if you're allergic uh, to make some sort of peanut sauce and then combine that with uh, anything we have left over. So uh, some sort of brown rice from this recipe. Uh, so we have leftover brown rice, we have leftover beans, any sort of leftover vegetables and makes a grain bowl uh, with some added protein and vegetables and some sort of sauce. So that's already five meals uh, off the top of my head from this book that we make with just um, with primary ingredients of chickpeas, oats, peanut butter, um, and grains, and maybe some vegetables. So a very short shopping list for just five recipes. And then when it comes to the actual cooking piece, um, meal preparation is very different for everyone, and different methods work best for different people. So the main goal is to uh, see what you can do ahead of time. So uh, even if it's the smallest things, like let's say you're preparing snacks for the week, you can chop all your celery at once and prepackage your hummus into little containers and have all that ready to go. Uh, or if you had a little bit more time on the weekends, uh, you could go as far as cooking all your beans at once, uh, cooking all your rice for the week at once, uh, roasting vegetables all at once. Um, you can make whole meals, things like soups and stews and meatloaves, um, casseroles freeze pretty well so you can make big batches of, of those at the on the weekend and freeze it for later uh in the week or even later in the month and cooking in large batches in this case helps as well so if you have time on the weekend to cook a recipe uh or some other day uh you could cook large batches of lasagna or uh, you could cook a lot of beans a lot, uh, you could cook a big batch of rice and freeze all that and not necessarily have a recipe for some of those things so maybe cook a bunch of beans and not know what to do with it, but have those beans on hand for later, just in case you want to make a quick uh, grain bowl or a quick meatloaf or something else or a quick chili, and just have those available for those times when you don't know what to make. Uh, and as far as efficiency goes, um, it's really important to when you're if you're doing any sort of meal preparation to multitask. So if you're setting aside some time on a weekday or a weekend to cook, uh, plan out what you're going to do uh, with the recipes you have on hand. So for example, if we had some recipes that required cooking beans and roasting vegetables and making some rice, um, beans take about 45 minutes to cook if you're soaking them and then uh, boiling and simmering them for 45 minutes uh, as opposed to using canned. And then roasting vegetables, it varies by vegetable, but roughly speaking for this example, we'll say 40 minutes to roast the vegetable. And then rice takes about 20 to 25 minutes to cook uh, using a rice cooker, sometimes longer if you're going to use a stovetop. But for example, we're going to use these numbers. Uh, but we're not going to, you know, take 45 minutes to cook the beans and then use 40 minutes to cook the rest, roast vegetables and then take 20 minutes to cook rice and spend an hour and 45 minutes total because we can get this really done in 45 minutes if we cook the beans first, put them on the stove top first, and then while the beans are cooking, we take, you know, five minutes to chop the vegetables up and then throw them in the oven, and that can cook and be done at around the same time as the beans. And then while that's cooking, you could also uh, rinse the rice, uh, put, it on, put it on the stove or put it in the rice cooker and cook that. And even further, while the rice is cooking, you could you know, do dishes, you could portion out oatmeal, you could portion out your snacks, um, you could chop more vegetables. Uh, you could do a lot of different things there within 45 minutes and have multiple things done by the end of that hour and spend less than half the time it would take to do everything separately. So being efficient with your time and multitasking as much as possible. And that was basically all I had. Um, so we've got about uh, 15, 20 minutes for questions. Uh, while Caitlin's gathering those, I do have my email address here, uh, alice.ma at wsu.edu. And you can feel free to email me if you have any questions on some of the links I provided or you want some more recipes, or recipes for some of the things I mentioned. Uh, I am also on Twitter. I don't tweet too much about general stuff, but I do tweet a lot about things I eat on campus, but um, feel free to follow me on Twitter as well. Thanks, Alice. So we do have a few questions already. The first is, 
Is there any difference in canned vegetables with sodium content? Is it better to buy a certain type of canned vegetable? Oh, that's a great question. Okay, so that will vary a lot by brand. Um, typically, there are some brands that will add sodium to the vegetable before canning and some brands that won't. And this, that's just a matter of uh, looking at the label. So if you read the label, uh, it will tell you how much sodium there is uh, and it will also tell you an ingredient list. So looking for added salt in the ingredient list uh, will tell you if there's added sodium in the vegetable. Uh, so just being careful because it varies a lot by brand and also by the type of vegetable. Thank you. And our next question asks, uh, my husband and I both have diet or dairy sensitivities. So I feel like we are missing out on certain vitamins, minerals, or beneficial bacteria. What can you recommend we do to supplement this inexpensively? All right. Uh, so coming from someone who is also dairy sensitive, uh, something I do is uh, there are a lot of non-dairy alternatives uh, on the market. So uh, there's soy milk is probably the most popular. And uh, in terms of uh, compare comparing it to dairy milk. Soy milk is probably the closest as far as protein content uh, to, to regular dairy milk. Uh, most non-dairy milks are also fortified with uh, calcium and vitamin B12. Uh, let's see, calcium, vitamin D, vitamin B12. And so uh, it's a matter of looking at the label and because uh, it does vary by brand, but I would say most brands nowadays have those three vitamins and minerals fortified as part of uh, all of their all of their products. Uh, so if you have a dairy sensitivity, soy milk is and almond milk and coconut milk tend to be the least expensive. Uh, you can also make your own version of those. It does take a little bit more effort uh, to make your own milks and those typically aren't fortified. Uh, but really the key nutrient when it comes to dairy is the calcium. And so you can get that from the fortified non-dairy milks, but you can also get it from things like tofu, uh, as well as uh, if you want to take a supplement, that's fine. But you can also get it from things, vegetables like spinach and kale, any sort of leafy green. Our next yeah. question is a clarification on an earlier slide um, on the average prices you referenced for like eggs and beans and stuff like that. And the person wanted to know if those included organic prices or if it was only conventional food or a blend of both. I believe it was a blend of both. Uh, it was just, the data just said average price in the U.S. Thank you. And our next question asks um, if for any more tips on meal planning or is are there any good free meal planners online like apps or worksheets that you know of? Uh, yeah, if you uh, do a quick search on the internet just for meal planning uh, and you search under the images, there are usually some sort of uh, template images, uh, just like blank templates you could fill in. Uh, I have one that I have. Uh, if you email me, I can send it to you if you would like. I have some of those websites saved somewhere. I don't have them on hand right now, but I could send them to you. Thank you, Alice. And that meal planning one might be a good one for a future event. Um, yeah. And then another question asks, if you have any websites for coupons, when you were mentioning coupons earlier, do you have any favorites? Yeah, uh, quite a few favorites. So for the most part, I do go directly to the brand of the product for the coupon, but I also like uh, coupons.com. And that is, that website, if you sign up for the email list, they'll email you every single week with new coupons. And it, the coupon list is pretty long. You can search by you know, grocery type, um, or things you need, or just scroll down and see what's there. Uh, I also really like uh, rebate apps. So these aren't technically coupons because you have to buy the product and then get the rebate back. But there is an app called Ibotta. So I B O T T A, and what they do is they uh, they have certain items on their list, and it varies by store. But if you buy the product and then you take a photo of the receipt, they'll give you about usually twenty five cents to a dollar back on the product. And then once you accumulate $20 in the app, uh, they'll pay you out either via, I think, via PayPal and give you your $20 back. So it's not a savings up front, but on the back end, you end up getting some money back there. Awesome. Um, and another person asks, are legumes inflammatory? I've looked into the Whole30 eating plan, and they are anti-legume. Uh, <laughs> um, not that I know of. I'm 
the whole 35 is pretty popular. I'm not a big fan of it. I know, you know, legumes can cause some problems as far as digestion in some people, especially if you're not used to eating them. Um, as far as inflammatory, I haven't heard anything about that. And I don't know too much uh, about, about that. But uh, generally speaking, they are fairly healthy. I eat them quite a bit. Uh, I don't see anything wrong with eating legumes on a regular basis. Excellent. Thank you. Another question asks, uh, do you think eggs are a concern as far as dietary cholesterol or fat? Yeah. So that's probably one of the most debatable and controversial topics in dietetics now. And uh, there's, there's a lot of different schools of thought. Uh, in terms of cholesterol, that really comes from the yolk uh, having saturated fat and uh, how the effect saturated fat has on dietary cholesterol. Uh, there are some thoughts about uh, the egg white, something in the egg white counteracting whatever is in the yolk uh, so that you can safely eat whole eggs because the yolk or the white sort of cancels out the dietary effect of the yolk. Um, I don't have a super strong side of that, uh, side answer for that question. Um, but generally speaking, I don't usually recommend, I usually say it's fine to eat maybe two or so eggs a day and not, uh, not be too concerned with cholesterol. Um, Personally speaking, I don't eat eggs because I, I do follow a plant-based diet for ethical reasons, but uh, I don't have a problem for health reasons uh, with people eating eggs. Thank you. And another uh, question on a type of food is, what do you have to, is soy healthy to eat? Yes, so there's, that's one of those uh, controversies out there, but uh, there are no studies that I know of that uh, say, uh, unless you're consuming really, really large amount of large amount of soy that there are unhealthy effects due to the hormones, um, you know, tofu a couple times a week, soy milk, things like that, soybeans, uh, a couple servings a day, that amount isn't really enough to affect us negatively for the general population. Thank you. And uh, a question asks, uh, if you have any tips or your favorite tips for healthy snack foods on a budget? Uh, I think my favorite tip is if you look at uh, the, the Good and Cheap Cookbook, there's a granola bar recipe there. And I think probably the easiest snack is some sort of granola bar um, because it does contain the oats, the grains, right? And the protein from peanut butter or some sort of nut butter. And then you can customize it to make it your own. So if you have allergies of peanut butter, you could use sunflower seed butter. Or if you don't like fruit, uh, you can omit the fruit, any dried fruit. Or if you like chocolate, you can add a little bit of chocolate and have a treat. Um, so making your own granola bars is probably my go-to snack. Uh, I do also have a recipe for a no-bake granola bar that's basically just peanut butter, oats, and a little bit of maple syrup. Um, if you want the recipe, you can feel free to email me. Uh, but that's a go-to recipe I use quite a bit. Uh, I also have a recipe for uh, snack bites that are made with, uh, they taste like cookie dough. They have a texture of cookie dough, but they're made with uh, ground chickpeas and then peanut butter. Uh, a little bit of applesauce to sweeten it, and then chocolate chips. And so they're, it has a texture of cookie dough. You can eat it with a spoon or roll it into little balls as a snack. Um, and then some other things I like are just celery and hummus. Very simple, no recipe required, uh, easy to prepare, and easy to store. And then um, simple things like fruit and peanut butter. Thanks, Alice. And... Um... Someone asked that sometimes veggies can get really boring. Any tips to diversify them? Yeah, vegetables. Uh, there are a lot of vegetables out there. And um, I think one way to diversify is to simply branch out and try new vegetables here and there. Uh, like I mentioned, when things are in season, take advantage and try something new because uh, you can cook vegetables almost all uh, different ways. So roasting, uh, sauteing, adding to stir fries. Um, I think the key with vegetables is to use spices. So um, varying, you know, things like curry spice, cumin, there are a lot of spices out there. So adding different spices to vegetables can really pump up the flavor um, and give it a little bit of different take than you're used to. Thank you. And um, our next question asks, is there any nutritional difference between organic and conventional food? Um, not really enough to worry about. Uh, and there are, I mean, there are studies that show both ways. So some studies show that our organic uh, has a few more nutrients than conventional, but there are also some fruits where the conventional product 
uh, had more nutrients than the organic. But generally speaking, there isn't enough of a difference to um, really warrant worrying too much about it. I think the only thing I would worry somewhat about uh, are the pesticides. Um, so if you go to the uh, website called the Environmental Working Group, so it's ewg.org, uh, they have a list called the Dirty Dozen. So if you worry about pesticide content, they print out a list every year called the Dirty Dozen where they list the top 12 fruits and vegetables that contain a lot of pesticides in the conventional form. So those are the fruits and vegetables I usually buy organic. And then the rest of the vegetables, fruits and vegetables, I don't really worry about. If I need to buy conventional, I'll buy conventional. But uh, usually top on the list are things like apples and strawberries. And so while they're not really different in terms of vitamin or uh, vitamin content, it's the pesticides uh, that are some people believe are linked to uh, cancer and other things like that. And those are that's really the only thing to worry about. So nutrient-wise, the vitamins and minerals, not too much of a concern.